at some point later this month. So I'll push on and uh, just to say we've got six amazing speakers today. We've got Victoria Lewis from Nourishing Norfolk, which is a network that supports food hubs across Norfolk, making sure, working to make sure that no one goes hungry in Norfolk. And Tori's questions from a food support perspective have framed our approach in this webinar. And she's going to say a bit more about that. We're going to have Phil Holtham from Feedback Global. He's going to say a little bit about the feedback story and the background to the work on gleaning that Feedback have done that resulted in the gleaning toolkit. He's going to talk us through the gleaning toolkit that is available online. And he's going to tell us a little bit about his work with Gleaning Sussex as well. We've got Rosa Farber from Lane's Farm in Sussex, and she's going to tell us about how gleaning has worked there. And then we have Holly, Jenny and Teresa, who are all part of the brilliant Gleaning Cornwall team, who are going to talk us through the practicals of running a gleaning network. We should have plenty of time for questions um, at the end after all of that. Uh, but if you do have questions as we go along, please put them in the chat with an asterisk at the beginning so that it's easy to pull them out. Um, or just wait until we have questions at the end and put them in the chat then. So I'm going to hand over now to Tori, who's going to say a bit more about how this webinar came about. Over to you, Tori. Thanks, Natasha. That's really kind. So I'm Tori Lewis. I work for uh, Norfolk Community Foundation as the Food Strategy Development Manager. Primarily, my role is to be involved in one of our strategic initiatives called Nourishing Norfolk. Um, as Natasha said, really, the, the core purpose of that is to ensure that no one in Norfolk goes hungry. And we work in partnership with a network of charities and voluntary organisations that run um, affordable food hubs, food clubs, larders, pantries, social supermarkets. And together, that network is supporting now around 28,000 people across the county. Now, that's in our one city, Norwich also in market and coastal towns, and also in rural locations right across the county. Um, I think one of our key challenges, as I'm sure is shared by many food partnerships around, around the UK, is unlocking supply of high quality, fresh produce at a price that allows um, those food hubs to have a viable, nutritious offer for their members. Um, and also to distrib distribute it across our large land area in such a way that doesn't overload that food with cost. Um, what we're doing now around supply is that hubs themselves, all run by separate charities, have their own direct relationships with um, farmers, manufacturers, distributors and with retailers. Then hubs also work together in local clusters, as it were, to redistribute and share food. And then as a sort of nourishing Norfolk network, we also um, have network wide distribution um, of ambient product from a central distribution hub in Norwich. Um, now the food hubs order from us weekly and that whole piece is facilitated by our relationship with a service provider called a private company called Norse, which is Britain's largest local authority trading company. They provide warehousing and space on their vans to get the food out. And that's all a pro bono offer. We also, as a network, have um, some key relationships with organisations such as the Royal Norfolk Agricultural Association, who connects us with farmers. So we've got lots of different threads leading into supply routes. And where we are, we do face some challenges around food costing more to, to really to get it here. And so we need quite a diverse and re resilient portfolio of supply routes to, to get food in. Um, what we want to achieve is, is that diversity and resilience of supply, but really specifically for fruit and veg, because um, many of the food hubs are still relying on purchasing fruit and veg from their local supermarket and then distributing it for free. Um, so ideally, we want to work with local growers here in Norfolk, and that is happening, but there's definitely potential to grow that. Um, 
the the growers here in Norfolk uh, that soft fruit and um, root veg and brassica right across uh, right across the um, the scale, and it's really high quality food that's grown here. So. Um, working with them supports and creates those local food partnerships that reduces the mile that food the miles that um, food is traveling. But also, I'm there are um, possible uh, great potential to maximize local surplus opportunities and absorbing that food waste. Um, so why gleaning and 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 today? Well, really, this came out of some really um, fantastic conversations facilitated by Natasha and the Real Farming Trust. And we were trying to think about all the different ways that you can maximise access to food that's grown locally to you. And um, we have these in Norfolk, we have these relationships with growers. But, but to be honest, gleaning is a big blind spot for us. Um, we know that there are um, some fantastic gleaning groups locally, particularly in Suffolk. There's an organisation called Still Good Food. And there are pockets of, uh, of activity. But I do think there's really potential to grow that. Um, but having an understanding of... Um, of what gleaning actually means and what it entails, I'm sure isn't just of interest to us, but for many food partnerships across the country. Um, so I suppose, really, I said to Natasha, can we try to have a conversation about the practicalities of getting a gleaning operation up and running, what the potential really is, and what it takes to keep it thriving, as I know um, organisations like Holly's are, are, are absolutely doing. So together we shaped some questions around um, around what we think might be useful for for food support spaces to know and for um, early organisations might want to know. And the speakers that we've got here who so kindly given their time are going to share their experiences and insight to try and answer some of those questions. Over to you, Natasha. Thanks very much, Tori. That's great. Uh, really good. Uh, kind of framing for what we're doing today and uh, I think Feedback Global have been real leaders in this area in terms of networking and so I'm going to hand you over now to Phil from Feedback who's going to tell you a bit more about that. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Natasha and grateful for the Real Farming Trust for organising this, this webinar. It's nice to have a chance to speak about gleaning because it's something I, I really love. Uh, I'm going to share screen because I've got a few slides. Um, Let's see. Can you see? Uh, you see that? Great. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little about gleaning. And first up, I just want to introduce feedback. I'm going to give you a whistle-stop history of the gleaning network over the last 10 years. And then, as uh, mentioned from by Natasha, I'm going to talk about the toolkit that we've developed, uh, which provides a sort of how-to guide for some of the, um, the methodologies and techniques and, and tools and, and knowledge that we've we've built up over the years. So just briefly about feedback. Feedback came about um, due to our founder, Christian Stewart, who uh, wrote this book about waste. We're an environmental charity. And uh, the genesis of feedback was this, this book that, that Christian wrote, which is all about um, the scale of food waste. And he put some stats and some stories and some potential solutions into this book. Um, and then he campaigned on it and did some projects around it, initially under the guise of feeding the 5,000 with these free meals in public spaces, the first two being in Trafalgar Square. But in the following years, um, from 2009 to 2012, um, and then I think the last one was in 2016, these feeding the 5,000 feasts were a, a way to, to bring together campaigners, chefs, business, policy makers, and the public to highlight food waste being a real issue that needed action. Uh, so this was the beginning of the last decade, uh, and that's the start of feedback. Um, we have since moved to a broader uh, scope than just food waste. We have campaigns all around food system sustainability, and um, that can include divesting from industrial meat. Um, we've got a campaign about unsustainable fisheries in West Africa, working with some uh, West African uh, fishery livelihood organizations at the moment, uh, but also stuff around sustainable soil. Um, and the team that I'm in is about community anchored 
um, social enterprise interventions to try and create a more circular food economy in um, in grassroots. So I'm based in East Brighton and um, run a project here called Sussex Surplus, uh, which is all about preventing food waste and increasing food access and also creating social employment. So that's a bit about feedback. Um, I'm going to give you a whistle stop talk whistle stop history of the gleaning network because um, some of you be aware gleaning is not a new thing it goes back a very long way uh, this is Ruth the gleaner in the old testament uh, who was permitted by the landowner on the left who I think it was called Bows, to pick uh, some leftover crops um, and they later got married I believe so this is the old testament version of it but um, it was revived by feedback at the start of the last decade um, in a slight, quite an ad hoc way. I'd say gleaning opportunities are often ad, ad hoc just due to the irregularity of surplus crops being available. Uh, but I think in the early days when it was very voluntarily run and uh, we were just starting out, the team was based in London and they would travel to farms in Kent or Suffolk or um, around the southeast without kind of being anchored in a particular place. So the initial practice was really just about banging the drum for food waste as a campaign and then doing media and campaigning and um and engagement on on food waste as an issue uh, that changed in 2016 with a um a lottery funded project called our bright future and feedback and a great food waste organization called food cycle teamed up for a three-year youth engagement project where we took young people out onto farms uh, across the country and ran gleaning days um and prevented food waste but also um created experiences that enabled young people to have a greater understanding of their environmental impact and afforded them the opportunity of making a positive difference so farming the future uh sorry far, farm to fork with our bright future uh was the kind of uh step change in feedback being able to deliver gleaning across the country and we had five regional coordinators uh, in Sussex, Kent, Bristol, Manchester, and uh, one in London as well, who um, served the sort of Essex and Lee Valley area. And um, th that was probably when feedback had the most capacity to be working on, uh, on gleaning. And we probably ran in the region of 80 to 90 gleans a year, uh, like about 20 in each in each region. Uh, and as I say, with a with a real focus on youth engagement. Um, and then in 2019, we got some funding from RAP, who um, the National Waste Charity, um, to help local groups to um, set up their own gleaning operations. And this is the sort of start of feedback changing from being more hands on in in the gleaning space and more working towards proliferating gleaning as a practice and enabling uh, locally embedded autonomous groups to take up the practice themselves. So uh, on the left, we've got some lovely Cornish gleaners who have been a really fantastic uh, and active group um, going since I think 2020. Um, and then top right, there's the Avon gleaning group who came about in this period as well and have also done, done fantastic work. Um, and bottom right is some Kent gleaners, um, deal based uh group who are who are really active as well so this um this moment i guess was a bit of a change where feedback were less hands-on and more um facilitating uh, cleaning and that involved doing things like uh basically promoting to community groups maybe of the sort that might be on this call today uh that we are growing the network and we're interested in speaking to groups uh, who might be interested in in starting gleaning and rap um our, our project with rap involved some seed grants that we were enabled to to hand over to to new groups to give them the resource to get certain equipment they might need or to to um, pay for a coordinator to do some of the initial work um and then since then oh what's going on with my presentation um, since th then, the other thing that we, we did with RAP is to really promote use of the toolkit so that anybody on the internet, be they in South Africa or elsewhere, um, Australia, um, America, could look at the tools and the uh, the methods that we've developed and say, okay, 
there is horticulture in my region. I know there's fruit and veg growing. Um, maybe there's a need in the community as well uh, for fresh fruit and veg. Uh, it might be appropriate for us to start a gleaning group, form relationships with growers and uh, donate glean produce onwards. So the Gleaning Handbook is um, an online resource I'm just going to talk about three aspects of it today because it's actually quite chunky and it's quite detailed. Um, but just as a kind of introduction to it, um, I think there's a, there's there's three things that are kind of quite useful for a group that's considering starting gleaning or or just curious about it. Three things that are really worth considering from the outset. And the first really is, um, oh no, this is just another thing about the map. So uh, within the toolkit, you can see that there are 26 groups across England, one in Wales and one in Scotland who are active gleaning. So you can click on those pins and have the contact details for those groups. Uh, it might well be that you're in an area where gleaning is already taking place. Um, so the first of the three things I'm going to talk about is, is the causes of, of food waste on farms, because it, it really pays to have a, a good understanding of how horticultural waste can come about if you're going to take steps and make an intervention in um in trying to prevent it and trying to redistribute it and there are loads of different reasons that, that can cause fruit and veg to be on a farm and not have a buyer and not be destined to be used and um i would say no two farms are the same no two growing seasons are the same and um there are so many variables within growing that whilst these are common causes they don't necessarily cover all of the situations that might occur um, but it's helpful to have the, an understanding of of why uh, so, sometimes farms can have a crop that's perfectly edible, but they're not able to sell it. Um, so these are the, the headline reasons that are within the toolkit. We've got the, the gluts that can occur from, from good weather. Um, obviously, farmers are um, the last people that would want to see food waste happen because they really value food. However, they do always, for good reason, uh, on the side of caution and plant more than they think they might anticipate needing. And that's because variables can can prevent their yield from being as high as they need it to be. So so overplanting a little bit can actually, in a, in a good year of, of weather, lead to, to um, more, more than they're able to sell. Um, Cosmetic standards are still a reason for certain fruit and veg being being left, particularly in in like top fruit. When growers, when their commercial teams go through, they have very quick um, methods of just like really going through quickly, and that they might have a sizing ring uh, on their picking baskets, and they'll just offer that up to the fruit. And if it's not the right size, they might leave it. If it has imperfections, they might leave it. Um, and whilst some stores are making efforts to have those wonky ranges that doesn't always translate to the decision ma made on the farm about the specifications that they're picking to or the orders that they receive um there's also issues around uh farmers having buyers that fall through for whatever reason or um their, their orders are cancelled and that can that can mean that there's a crop that's that's ready to go that that is no longer in demand um we also see pick your own farms, which have quite particular seasons. Um, the one that we engage with uh, in Sussex quite a lot is, is post Halloween, pick your own pumpkin farms just to shut on November 1st. So there's a high volume of uh, edible squashes and edible pumpkins that are available in November. Um, but other pick your own farms might also have a particular season or particular opening window where after that window um there's there's fruit available to be gleaned um the harvesting capacity has been a real thing post brexit with shortage of farm workers as well as um the weaker pound meaning that fewer european laborers are coming over to work because um the exchange rate is is less less desirable for them in terms of how much they earn through a season here also um probably something to do with uh, stigmatization maybe of of the role and and stigmatization of foreign workforce even though they're essential workers so um yeah staff shortages uh, at the at the kind of um as a whole agricultural sector can lead to gleaning opportunities as well uh increasingly unpredictable weather with climate change and um just general 
variability of conditions can can lead to crops being uh, mistimed or um, if you've got a succession of crops and they all ripen at the same time due, due to a certain uh, pattern of weather that was not not predicted can can lead to a farmer having more more food than they're able to sell and then the last one we've got listed is is experiments and trials where um, growers try things out without necessarily having a market in mind so all of these are causes and this isn't an, an exhaustive list but these are the causes of issues that farmer, farms might face that lead to them having a crop that they're not able to sell and is at risk of going to waste. And I think it really pays to have an understanding of these things when you're having conversations with farmers, because um, I think there is a risk if you enter a conversation without a farmer without this understanding that you you risk stigmatizing uh, or or trying to uh, prompt some sort of shame around uh why there is a, a, a surplus crop and and I, I do really think farmers are the last people that want to see food waste occurring so i think having having this understanding enables you as a as a potential gleaning group to 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 start that conversation with a farmer not in a way that's in any way accusatory or or, or assumptive about um their their operation and i think it should also be noted that gleaning is not the, the first port of call in fact it's the last port of call for for growers they're they're trying to earn a, a, a living in a, in a very difficult role and a very difficult market and um and they're entitled to to get a return for what they grow and i actually sometimes think as a gleaning coordinator if you're able to find a, a customer for, for the grower when they've got a surplus crop then that food waste that you might have to deal with is no longer food waste and your problem is is solved without even lifting a finger and uh the farm is is more stable or financially secure from getting an income from their crop so um i do think it's worth saying that as a food waste activist if you're able to prevent a, a farm having a crop that is surplus by finding them a buyer then uh that's a win as well as you know going to harvest it yourself and donating it to a, a good cause which is also a win uh so that's just about causes of food waste i've got something on the prerequisites um which i think is section eight of the the toolkit um in terms of health and safety because you can't get going without having these basic essentials so it's a public liability insurance policy that um includes coordinating volunteers on farms it's quite a specific thing and your insurers will, will need to know that um you've got a trained coordinator in place being taking responsibility for a group of volunteers and that it may involve harvesting knives um so that's that's number one uh the the insurance the second thing that's really key is having a team member who's got first aid training who's present so always having one person who's gleaning with first aid training um have a risk assessment template that you can update and um what we recommend is uh, for each farm that you visit, including any site specific risks. So one of your questions to the farmer in planning the day is, do you have any site specific risks that I should know about to put in the risk assessment? Be that open bodies of water uh, or trees that are particularly high around the edge of the field or um, particularly active track with uh, vehicles passing, passing nearby. <clears throat> Anything that's site specific should be added in addition to the template risk assessment that you have. Um, it's worth having a prepared briefing so you just know precisely what people need to, to hear at the start of the day. Uh, and we have on the toolkit like a checklist of things that need to be passed on. Some things as simple as the housekeeping, where to use the loos and if there's access to running water, um, but other things around um, you know man manual handling and harvesting technique that uh, it's, it's useful just to have from the outset. And then the final thing is just to what to do in the event of any accident. So having um, an awareness of your precise location, knowing where the nearest A&E is, um, having all the contact numbers that you need uh, on you on the day is all, all essential and all good planning. Um, the third thing I just want to point to is a way of keeping organized. And it's about logging contacts with um, horticultural producers and, and farmers um, in your area. And it basically just enables you to 
to grow your um yeah your understanding i guess or your or your records of of farmers in your region so by having a spreadsheet that enables you to list all your horticultural growers uh have their contact details and also log when you've had communication with them it just means that you're not nudging them or inquiring with them more often than they might feel comfortable with um but it also prevents you from uh yeah i guess trying to access farms that aren't suitable um and it, it year on year these records are really helpful to know like okay this farm end of september had this crop that was available so maybe we should reach out to them in late august and say um do you think do you think you're uh, potentially going to have surplus uh, again this year so that's just um three aspects of the toolkit which are far from covering everything but i thought would be a welcome um overview and um that's it from me but i'm going to be in the in the q a and um happy to talk more about gleaning so i'll, I'll hand back back over to natasha Thanks very much, Phil. That's a great overview. And I've put the link to the Gleaning Handbook in the chat so that everyone can access all of that information and so much more about gleaning. Um, it's a really, really thorough job, the, the Gleaning Handbook that Feedback has made available free of charge. So I would really recommend people to have a look at that link when the webinar is over. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Rosa from Lane's Farm, who's going to tell us about gleaning from the farmer's point of view. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many people interested in food and getting food to people. And um, Phil covered loads of like essential parts. So I'm probably just going to repeat a bit of what he said, um, but just from the farm's perspective. And also just to say that the role that Phil and hopefully a lot of you will be um, facilitating is or already do facilitate is so essential. And I think to have more people in that position where connections between different bubbles in our society can be, you know, crossed because um, that's in between those bubbles is, is a lot where food can kind of get lost and wasted. And so, yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so just to say, my name's Rosa and I'm from Lane's Organic Farm. I run the farm with my mum, Toos Yoken, who started it in um, 1978. We're a biodynamic fruit, veg and flower farm and just north of Brighton, uh, about 20 minutes north of Brighton. Um, and it's always been organic since 1978. We became biodynamic about 10 years ago. Uh, and a lot of our outlets are wholesale but we, also, we have a whole range of outlets. So we do uh, farmer's markets, a veg box, sell directly to other farm shops, um, like retail and then restaurants, cafes, and a few community groups as well. Um, some of which are in Brighton, some local organized community groups, and then one from West London who comes down. Um, and because we have this field scale we have a few polytunnels but it's mainly field produce traditional uh seasonal vegetables kind of rooty stocky vegetables so we do salad as well but a lot of what we grow takes a whole year to grow as opposed to the eight week six week salad crops that a lot of people do um and that means that like uh phil said there's lots of variables um it can be eaten by birds, which it does a lot of the time, <laughs> um, or too much rain or too or not enough rain. So we speculate, we speculate on how, oh, another thing to say is we're an independent growers. So we don't have contracts with supermarkets. We kind of gauge from our wholesale customers um, how much they'll want, but often they're working with chefs who might not want the same menu next year. So, um, for example, this year we had a lot of Crown Prince squash, probably, I mean, in the end now we've sold it, but for a few months we thought we'd have about four tonne extra. Um, but luckily they've come round to it now. And the other thing is beetroot. We have a lot of beetroot because last year the chefs really wanted long red beetroot. And this year no one's interested in it. So Phil, I might be calling you up in a few weeks time. Um, 
but yeah so basically uh because we're independent we speculate which means we might have a glut um and why do farmers like gleaners um well like phil said it is a last resort for us ideally we want to sell it um but also as phil said <laughs> um it's great to see food being used and eaten and nourishing people. So it also helps clear a field at this time of year, particularly um, clear the fields for the new crops. So um, that's great. And that it doesn't get wasted, that it goes to people. And that also when we have a big uh, gleaning network group coming uh, to the farm, it's wonderful to be with so many people in a field because usually um you're kind of on your own or with like maybe one or two other people in a big field and it's lovely to see people on the land and you can have conversations and make connections and they can come back maybe on another glean and um yeah often I'm around Brighton and I'll like be at a gallery or a exhibition or something and someone will say oh I think I've been to that farm once to pick and I can't remember but it's nice that uh, so many people in Brighton have actually been here uh, and remember you know certain crops and things um and yeah so um i guess mess uh notes for gleaning network people uh leaders would be to stay in connection with both people who want to experience working on the land for a day or two a month or or you know just have a connection with a local food producer um so and also stay in connection with the farmer try and establish like regular communication so that if um because sometimes we have a glut of stuff that we've already picked uh which then you know with broccoli for example you have to pick it at a certain point so um and then if we don't have a buyer we'll have all this picked broccoli uh so then we contact fair share or sussex surplus so that's post gleaning but um it's still important that that finds a home um and so if that connection with farmers is established, that can kind of, it's very ad hoc, as Phil said. So yeah, that can still go somewhere. And then if you're a gleaning leader, maybe pre-site visit, uh, just like scout out where people can park, where the toilet is, if there is a toilet, um, where the kettle is, if there is a kettle, if you want to make a cup of tea. Um, and yeah, check the weather. And also have a look at the crop that you're going to be gleaning and see how many people would be appropriate because you don't want like 50 people if it's just like a 20 minute job to pick, you know, you might be able to do it very quickly and then you've got loads of people driving there, which is, you know, a waste of energy and people's time and stuff. So make sure like the group is appropriate to the job um, and tell the grower what, what happens to it, tell them how many people it's fed or what you've done with it or send them a you know like Phil gives us um the long life soups that they make sometimes and it's really nice to see that you know where it's going and how it's being used that's very fulfilling um and yeah um I think I've said most of what I was going to say oh yeah obviously don't leave a mess like pick up not make sure you don't leave knives in the field or buckets or bags or anything um, and be flexible um, there's lots of variables so at the last minute there might be a storm in which case you can't come gleaning um, so yeah stay try and stay flexible um, and yeah so in the past we've had groups come to glean leeks potatoes chard apples apples is probably quite a common one so <laughs> probably you're getting apples from other places but um yeah we sometimes do have apples it's great for juicing uh new potatoes sprouts beetroot and yeah I also want to say that I'm not sticking around for the questions because I've got to um go harvest stuff for the market but if anyone has any questions before I leave uh the chat let me know oh is that one yeah, Rosa, there's a question in the chat for you. Maybe you could just take this one if you're happy to hang around for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, it's from Emma Croft. She says, I'm always a bit concerned about imbalancing the market from the farmer's perspective and wondered what your view was on that. 
in balancing the market as in um then that crop can't be sold is that what you mean I think that's probably what wrote, yeah. uh, what Emma means here. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well. Um. Okay. Putting out free food. Um. Yeah. I mean, it is a last resort. I think the thing is with veg, you can't keep it. So if that's also what um is great with Sussex surplus, for example, they can process it and have the or you can freeze a lot of fruit. Um. So the processing of fresh vegetables um to make it last longer is great and then um yeah but from our perspective we don't have the facility to process it we only make apple juice sometimes we make jams and stuff but that's not really large scale that's just to sell on the market but um there's the green bed. um uh well not really because i think the group the groups in Brighton anyway wouldn't be coming to uh, the markets in Lewis or the shops that we sell to. Um, and I guess, um, sorry, keep reading the chat. Um, I guess um, it's reaching far more people than our outlets would reach if it's going to a big cleaning network or a soup kitchen or, you know, community groups. Um, so I think there's just, there's, way too many people for small farms to feed at the moment and basically we just need more farms uh, local farms to feed the population in our area so if a small farm a local farm does have a huge amount of veg that can reach people that's great that's just saving you know more imported veg from having to come into the UK and keeping it local and less mileage on food and stuff like that. So I think just, and then maybe even the people that would uh, taste the glean stuff might be like, oh, that's much better tasting or much better for me. So I'm going to try and seek it out at the market or a shop that, you know, this farm sells to or another veg box or something. So I think it's also about promoting local and organic if you're using an organic farm or yeah, it's about promoting the local food network. So I don't think it's taking away from um, sales in any way. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Rosa. I'm not going to ask you to answer those other two questions because I know the next uh, presenters from Cornwall Gleaming, Gleaning will be able to answer them at the end. So uh, we'll let you go and do your harvesting. Okay. Thank, <laughs> you, thank you very much. Have a great thank day, you. everyone. Bye. Bye, Rachel. Bye. Um, so we're going to go over to Cornwall Gleaning now, who are going to tell us about the practicals of um, running a gleaning network. And uh, they've had great success in Cornwall. So I'm really excited to hear about what, what you're going to tell us, Holly. Over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm just going to get a share of screen going. Give me just a second. I'm not as good as this. Uh, Phil. Uh, right. Does that look right? Give us a nod. Can you see that? Great. Um, so uh, greetings from the Wild West. Um, it was Phil who started us on our journey back in 21 with a bit of fun funding. Um, it wasn't much. Um, it actually cost quite a lot to do this on a decent scale. Um, we're spending about 35 grand a year now um, and that covers uh, two pickup trucks and a team of gleaning coordinators, the insurance, the uh, training, the um, permanent kind of having to go to events that we get asked to do um, to promote ourselves and what we're doing. Um, fundraising, uh, you know, doing it in a in a uh, WI um, and uh, applying for big lottery grants, um, uh, the whole spectrum has to be covered. Um, and obviously, people's time is is the main thing, uh, and trying to do things in a safe uh, safe way. So, um, I'm really grateful for Be Feedback Glo Global for getting us going. Definitely, um, we sort of started relatively small 
in the back of my uh, my old Honda Civic, uh, not looking very hygienic there, but um, it was great fun. And we just uh, started uh, in the January and we kept going for a bit. And then I just did it on my own because there was no funding. And then basically I was invited to um, a sort of organization that covers Cornwall that was set up in um, lockdown, which was a, a, a group of, um, from feed uh, what's it called feeding britain um the public health from cornwall council and various trussell trusts and food banks and um uh, organizations that came together monthly and i was invited to join and they basically helped me uh, in the september of that year get a big amount of funding of for 10 grand um and so it grew steadily um throughout uh, the year ahead to being quite an amazing little gang um mainly down to amazing coordinators and a fantastic backup uh from teresa who you'll meet uh, in a bit um and so yeah we now have um i would say a regular gang of about 30 volunteers that go out nearly every week occasionally we can't because it's either too wet or too dry and there's nothing to glean but um we have steadily been growing um i think what a lot of you are most likely to be interested in is the funding side so i'll just quickly whiz through that because that's what i tend to spend a lot of time doing um so your county councillors um each for each area and i don't know councils vary so um sorry if this doesn't apply to you but our county councillors have pots of funding that start in the uh, April, uh, it's a few thousand pounds um, that they're able to give out within their community. And so I have emailed all of the ones in Cornwall and got a, quite a big amount, um, basically explaining where in their local facility, uh, vicinity that we were um, supplying free food to. Um, we are really keen to keep this free um, because we know that community food organisations really struggle for the fresh produce as alerted to earlier. And we've got to feed people in need healthy stuff, right? So um, we're really keen to keep to that free offer. And we're now feeding, helping feed about 10,000 people most weeks through about 100 different organisations. That's um, community larders, community kitchens and food banks across Cornwall, the whole of it, and um, a bit of West Devon. Going back to the funding, um, we did a crowdfunder near the beginning um, for a couple of pickups and a trailer, which was really good fun, but incredibly time consuming. Um, if you're gonna do that, I recommend you do, because it really helps market um, through any social media and the press, um, because you've got something that they can sort of get involved with and something to see. And we did a really good little dancing. We were all dancing with various vegetables across Cornwall. It was hilarious. Um, but yeah, you can get sometimes match funding. We got some through our council, but we missed out on Aviva, which seemed to permanently have this sort of match for any um, uh, crowdfunding, which can bump it up. Then of course, you've got your local Tesco's, they have those little token drop things. Um, the form filling is ridiculous and time consuming, but worth the effort, because again, that's marketing, telling your story in the Tesco stores. Um, and yeah, that sort of trickles quite a lot of money in. Asda, um, I finally managed to get through their quagmire um, <laughs> of uh, application and we got £600 uh, this week. Woohoo! Uh, but you're only allowed to apply for one store in your county a year. Um, and so um, choose a big one and ask for more than they suggest because I just did what I was told and I should have asked for more. Um, then local housing associations, um, we've had luck with a couple of those actually um and they sort of have money come in and out so if you approach them then they'll bear you in mind later um i spend quite a lot of time looking at grin which is some sort of uh, grant something something network um they're really cool it's relatively cheap 100 pounds for two years and you get a daily email and a massive spreadsheet every month which takes me two days to go through um so that that's worth it and but it may be 
excuse me, other organizations that within your network that already get this, that you can just nick the spreadsheet off them. Um, but I'm up for supporting the Grin Co-op if you can afford it. Then there's Grant Finder, um, which I dip in and out of. Um, it's a monthly prescription. And again, they send um, emails with different grants that aren't on Grin, which um, can help pad out uh, what you, you've got as an option. So when you're doing the funding bids, um, you want to obviously tick their boxes and talk in their language and um, make it easily readable though um uh, it helps for us that we've got a bit of background so we know how much we've uh, saved in tonnage and how much that equates to in carbon savings um a friend of mine worked that out and that was really useful and also how much money we've saved food charities um because then it's it sort of snowballs basically it makes it easier every time so the main key points that I always include is that you've got happy, healthy gleaners getting out into the sunshine, all the rain and the wind, uh, as was this week, um, uh, that are get, making new friends. Um, a lot of them are semi-retired. They're keeping really fit and they're doing something that cheers them up because it's not only saving waste and the, uh, helping the environment, therefore, but also um, uh, helping people in need. Then you, obviously you've got the whole feeding people in need piece and it, we have really found that food charities struggle for fresh produce. Um, a lot of the stuff that is being given by the supermarkets is bad for us and we need to preferably reduce that horrible white bread you know don't don't take it. <laughs> um, uh, I just think it's it, I'm passionate that we need to give people who are struggling the best food we can. Um, and that's something that I tell the farmers because um, I think it's important for them to understand the issues that we're currently facing. And it's um, sadly massive, you know, it's working families uh, since starting in 2021. The number of organizations we deal with has doubled and what the organizations are dealing with has doubled also. Um, and it's a lot around, you know, just general costs on um, you need to work out your areas of deprivation and what the actual local um, problems are, which you might already know, but that obviously helps with the funding bids. Wider benefits, um, you're raising awareness wherever you go, wherever you talk, wherever you're invited to have a stall or um, do fundraising about um, food poverty, as well as our need to reduce food waste. Um, which, you know, it's mainly 70% of food waste comes from our own homes. And I think that's a really important message because it's, it's otherwise, you know, you're wasting your, your potential of making good change. Um, I did this little banner for a Royal Cornwall show and that sort of just tries to get a, a feel of what we're doing, why we're doing it and um, what we're dealing with. Um, and um, another thing is that it obviously because we're dealing with farmers, um, we're learning what the issues are for them and how difficult things are right now. And um, I think a lot of the volunteers have learnt, oh hell, you know, this is this is hard <laughs> um, and, and have become more empathetic to farmers as a result. And wherever I talk or um, uh, Jenny and Teresa are dealing, you know, we try and get across that it's farmers need support and we're not spending enough on uh, of, on good food. Um, so gleaning because people get it, um, it gets you through doors and it gives you this potential to have more conversations. Um, and I'm part of Sustainable Food Cornwall and I see on the call here there's quite a few people from Sustainable Food Places and I'm uh, you know linked in with various sort of other networks which all helps with the fundraising and um, with gaining sort of um, good connections that can help both ways. Um, the other thing that we've discovered is we're helping the food charities better network together um, Teresa set up this big um, sort of load of WhatsApp groups for different areas um, and as a result you know those areas are bundled in a WhatsApp group and then they can contact each other um, and um, share surplus that they might have loads of nappies or whatever so that's a sort of addition that you might not think of um, and also 
uh, we created this map um, showing where we deliver to, and that is looks like going to be taken up by other organizations. So um, because we're on the ground dealing every day or every week at least with uh, all the organizations, we can keep maps updated far better than councils can. Um, and so insurance, I use Markle Direct, but I have discovered uh, Nature Save are really nice. Um, and yeah, as Phil mentioned, get the specifics in there about dealing with sharp knives and looking after bad backs. Um, that's what I cover. Uh, there might be other things you want to include. It's up to you to co-design it with them. And you shouldn't have to pay too much. I pay 150 um, vehicles. Yeah, we got a couple of really wonky old ones. If you can get good ones right from the offset, then you're not throwing good money after bad. And um, so I recommend that. You've got to keep your team and your volunteers equipped with, uh, I use Glenware uh, 10 inch serrated knives as Phil put me onto and they are still sharp Phil. Um, and yeah, really sharp. So you need the, the cut proof thermal, um, preferably uh, annoyingly, you can't get cut proof thermal waterproof gloves, which is, ah, uh, um, but then also waterproofs for the coordinators, as uh, Phil said, the first aid kit, kit health and hygiene training, I'm safeguard trained. Um, and just to mention that uh, I think Jenny will come on to this, um, that we get new gleaning volunteers to fill in a form, um, basically to see if they've got any health issues that we ought to know about. And just to sort of say that if they do something, it's not our fault, you know, a bit of a disclaimer. Um, yeah, so the uh, farmers are um, vital to keep them sweet and to keep them happy and keep saying thank you. Um, but the volunteers are the back of it and um, our coordinators, Jenny is top coordinator, is brilliant at looking after people and not going out if the conditions are uh, treacherous or too much no <laughs> this week <laughs> monday was a bit mental um but you know it's about looking after them not overdoing it not doing too many hours that so they don't want to come back etc so happy to answer questions later on and lots of love to you all lovely people i'll stop sharing Thanks, Holly. Um, Holly, are we hearing from Jenny and Teresa now? Is that right? Okay, so yeah. I think Jenny and Teresa, you're both in the same space, aren't you? That's great. Um, so you're going to say a little bit more about being a uh, Gleaning Network coordinators. Yes, well, I'm actually the coordinator, one of the coordinators for Gleaning Cornwall. Hello, everyone. I'm Jenny. Um, I whizzed over to, to Teresa's because my, uh, my tech wasn't working very well. So um, yeah, so I, I started not long after Holly had set up Gleaning Cornwall. Um, I started in courgette season. Um, now my my year seems to um, revolve around what's growing at, at particular times of the year. And mostly in Cornwall, we grow brassicas. So we're very brassica heavy down here, which is brilliant because brassicas, as most of you will know, are really high in nutrition. So they're, they're absolutely perfect for people who are in food poverty um, and they they cook really easily as well. You can make lots of things with brassicas winter and summer. Um, so I pretty much took everything from um, the feedback information um, um, and um, we, we just gen gently kind of made it work for us in our area um as we work through because you kind of start with a bit of an idea of what you're doing and then you just get out in the field and you get on with it really it's all a bit challenge annika which is fantastic and you really have to think on your feet um so the first thing that we needed to do or a couple of things that we needed to do were to find some produce which meant um sourcing farmers and speaking to farmers and the second thing that we needed to do was to find a fantastic um group of people who were going to come out and harvest this potential produce for us. So we kind of trolled through the internet, um, looking at local farms and basically just ringing up farmers and telling them what we were about and what we'd like to do. And over the last sort of three years, we've grown a team of about 30 farmers um, and local producers, some of whom we work with pretty much on a weekly basis all throughout the year. 
some of whom we may only we may only have produce from offered from maybe once or twice a year. Perhaps it's a local producer who has a glut of something in the summer, and we might go out and whiz out and take some some produce from them. Uh, we don't get much fruit down here, but we do get we do get some um, apples in the in the late summer, which is always great um, for people. So, speaking to farmers, farmers are always very very busy, and um, I found that I was quite frustrated to begin with with talking to farmers because. I would ring and I would, you know, give my best sales pitch and and then I would get nothing back from them. And what I've learned is that that's not about um, them not caring. It's just about them being incredibly busy. Their workload is phenomenal. Um, it has literally rained here for about four months now and the ground is completely sodden. Um, it's caused tremendous difficulty for us as a team to get in and out of fields um it's um it it's it causes me to be uber aware of the health and safety of my volunteer base um because it's very very slippery and they are walking around with big 10 inch knives in their hands um and carrying potentially fairly heavy produce so it's really important when you speak to your volunteers to to remind them about all of those health and safety issues of being mindful of your back always ask for somebody to help if it's too heavy put your knife down hold your knife facing down all of those things that we think are really common sense but when you're in a field and it's windy and raining um you can sometimes just really easily forget so it's very very important to be right on top of um, health and safety with the volunteers because they are the backbone workforce of Gleaning Cornwall. They are absolutely our heroes and we really, really couldn't do it without them. Our volunteers don't only just come into the field and volunteer, we also have volunteer drivers. Um, Teresa will explain what happens with them later when she chats. Um, um, and they're amazing. They just come out rain or shine um, and they have a really good social time and I think that's really important we came out of um of the pandemic and what I noticed was that people that would hardly even talk to each other now people car share they're really good friends and we have social events out together um our volunteers tell their friends and in turn their friends come out and they glean so it works really, really beautifully and quite organically like that. So the other way that we would get volunteers is, as Holly mentioned, going out to local events um, and just showing our face, taking a banner and interacting with the public, um, inviting them to go to our website where they can fill in um, a sign up form for volunteering for various different volunteer roles. So that's something that you could do on your website. Uh, to invite people for various different volunteer roles. Um, yeah, um, I don't really know what more to say, social really. Media. Social media, yes, I do a lot of the social media. So we have um, we have all the Facebook and um, Instagram accounts and a fantastic website that Teresa has been putting together. Um, so after every glean, um, up during the gleans, I take photographs. Obviously, I'm always asking people if it's OK with them to have their image on social media. And we make reels and. Um... Use it for <laughs> glean events. Oh, yeah, we use it for glean events. So if, I, if I'm having a glean, um, I'll pop I'll pop that out on social media that, um, you know, there's a glean happening. It's happening in a particular area. Um, and people are then invited to contact us to find out the exact location. I don't tend to put the exact location out on social media in the public. Um, I think that's um, it's quite nice for the farmers if, if we can be a bit more private about that. So we just invite people personally along to a glean. Um, yeah, there's upkeep of vehicles, um, vehicle training, um, and just keeping keeping everybody afloat, really. That's kind of the way that I see my role, keeping everybody afloat, keeping everybody happy. Um, people are really engaged in what we're doing. They're really interested in what we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, 
and they they uh, they just blows my mind really people people were out on monday the weather down here on monday was particularly atrocious it was literally blowing a gale we were right down in the far west of cornwall um and we still managed to take one and a half tons of cauliflowers in two hours um most of those were out on people's plates at the end of the day so i think it's pretty amazing what can be done when you get yourself a decent team together and you really engage people, you look after people um, and you engage with the farmers and they and they see what you're doing. So good luck. I really hope that this can be taken everywhere where produce is growing because it's there's no reason why it couldn't be. Thank you so much, Teresa. That's great and lovely to hear that story at the end of what you did on Monday. I'm, I'm sorry, that's Jenny, isn't it? In <laughs> Teresa thing, yeah. Um, so, Teresa, you, you're going to finish up with a little bit of uh, information about logistics and distribution, and um, hopefully, we'll continue on that um, note in the in the questions. We've got. Um, I'm really hoping that we'll have at least 20 minutes for questions, but that gives you only two minutes to speak. So I don't know whether we can compromise on that a little bit. So, um, Teresa, as it, it would be great to hear from you, but I think we'll probably follow up in the chat yeah, as well. OK, right. I'll try and be really quick about it. Um, so um, I took over doing the sort of uh, distribution and logistics in April 2022 22, and there were about 30 organizations by then and we were ringing everybody up every week and saying oh this is what veg we've got and I it worked out really quickly that I needed to make some quite big changes in there um, so I done three main changes um, I implemented some whatsapp groups um, that were in different areas across the county so that I could communicate through one message and people could get back to me. Um, I put in a shared um, Google diary, uh, which meant that we can put our events and the whole team can see what's happening and we communicate. And we also do everything through Google Sheets. So if you create something, other people know about it already. So I have a massive spreadsheet with all of the organizations, with what produce is going where, and all of the team can see that. Um, but my motto is very sort of keep it simple and share on a need to know basis because otherwise it can confuse things. Um, ensure good data protection, which is always really important. Um, so today there are about 80 organizations that take um, produce off us every single week. From that, they also distribute out to other organizations. So about another 30 organizations um, get that produce each week from us. I've split the county into um, eight distribution groups. That's basically, um, it goes on really on volunteer drivers and, and roads network and working out where that can actually go out to, which makes sense. Um, so I, I send out a message on a WhatsApp group to the organization saying, you know, on Tuesday, we're gleaning cauliflowers. How many would you like of each um, crates? You know, if it's crates or whether it's sacks, that's what day it's being delivered. Um, they then ping me a message back saying one, please, two, please, five, please, or however many they need. And that all goes into a spreadsheet. From there, um, I then have to think about my volunteer drivers. I've got a whole sort of network of volunteer drivers. I need to find out who can drive that week. Um, I need to think about what vehicle they've got, what load capacity, what rate, weight restrictions that is. Um, I need to think about um, you know, the amount of produce that's got to go to an area and whether somebody's got a vehicle big enough or enough weight capacity to carry it. I also need to think about their physical ability. Some of our volunteers are elderly, some have children and therefore, you know, need to fit it in with school runs. I need to take in account things like road closures. Um, we need to work out where different drivers are going to meet up. So, Quite often, a, a one volunteer will take it so far, 
they'll then meet um, a meeting point. There might be two or three drivers there. Those drivers will then take it off in different directions. It might go off again somewhere else and then has to go through another um, driver. So I have to do, you know, drop sheets so that, um, you know, people know where they're going, how much produce is going to go to each organization. Um, and there's lots of communication to sort of talk to the organizations to find out, you know, where it's actually going, where it needs to be delivered that week. Sometimes it can change um, at the last minutes. So you've got to act really quickly to resolve issues. Um, I need to know that organizations are going to collect promptly from our distribution hubs that we send it to, because obviously we need to keep a good relationship with them. Um, we need to think about health and hygiene and where it's being put down, things like that, you know. Um, so it's constantly fast moving. There's always new organizations join, joining all the time. It is growing ridiculously fast at the moment just because of the state of, um, you know, the struggles people are going through. Organizational changes can sort of throw spanners in the works. Suddenly somebody that you've been communicating with isn't there. They might've been using your, their personal mobile to communicate with you. So you've got to work out new ways. Um, always having to swap loads and routes around different drivers so that we can make it all happen. There's often issues like um, the there might not be enough in the field to be able to meet what people have, have requested because it's, it's always a request, it's not an order because we can never guarantee that we're gonna get it to them. But they're very understanding of that. Sometimes a driver can't make it, I've got to suddenly find another driver at the last minute. Um, there might be delivery mixes up, you know, maybe the driver went past a stop and forgot to drop some off. I've got to then work out how to get produce back. Think about traffic, time delays, um, you know, uh, an organization might close before we actually manage to get our driver there because they've been held up somewhere. Then suddenly I've got to find a different location where that can be stored overnight or where it can be left, where it can be collected. Um, also, the drivers need to know directions of where they're going, sending out map pins, what three words. Um, I need to have a database or um, photographs of locations, of door codes, gate codes, uh, things like that, so that I can, you know, get that message get that information to somebody really quick. The other thing that's really important is getting our crates back, which can be incredibly difficult without crates. We've got nothing to pack it in. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of quite good. Um, and then the other side of it is collecting data. I do a lot of collecting data, produce type, the number of crates that went out, the average weight, the total weight of, of sort of produce that we're sending out, um, but also looking for new produce. So we actually do um, various things. We have a coffee company that I managed to find, which um, donates us lots of coffee. Um, so we get lots of coffee beans that we managed to send out, which is fantastic. Those organizations are now giving out lots of free coffee um, and lots of cups of coffee to their various people coming through the door, which makes a huge difference to people giving quality coffee. Um, and we've had things like biscuits, um, we, um, cream, which is always a challenging one because you've got to think about temperature and how you're going to transport it. Can you get it there in time before it warms up? Cool boxes, things like that. <clears throat> so there is a really fast snapshot <laughs> of what I do. I hope that helps. <laughs> Teresa, that's really amazing. I mean, it sounds like a complete um, puzzle to be solved uh, <laughs> all the time. And um, I, I thank you so much, all, all three of you from Gleaning Cornwall, uh, describing describing what you've been doing so well. Um, we've got 15 minutes roughly now for questions. And uh, there was a question uh, asking to Teresa and Jenny, um, are you a paid coordinator or a volunteer? 
if you don't mind answering that? And if paid, how many hours do you do per week? A very straightforward, practical question. Okay, so I am both. <laughs> um, yeah, I get paid one day uh, um, a week, um, but I probably work um, every day, <laughs> very basically. Um, seven days a week, I do stuff towards cleaning. Uh, so yeah. I, yeah, I'm paid as well. I'm paid. I don't, I don't work full time. I work part time. Um, originally, I took on a paid role of three days a week, um, which I shared with a friend. So it's one and a half days a week. Um, but as Teresa said, and because of the nature of gleaning, it does kind of seep into every day, which is absolutely fine um, because I, I really love it. Um, but I would say I probably work about 15 hours a week. I maybe a little bit more depends really sometimes it's there's there's no there was no work for eight weeks last year so no gleaning for eight weeks last year in the hungry gap okay thank you that's helpful there's been another couple of questions in the chat um but phil do you want to jump in with a question there i just wanted to follow up on the how, how much people work um question because one of the things that we don't feedback in the past when we had regional coordinators was to have annualized hours contracts and that's uh, a type of contract that reflects seasonal variability. So you can say that someone's you know, scheduled to do 15 hours a week for a six month or eight month period that might be June to November, or December or something like that. And uh, the annualized hours contracts enables them to do five weeks, five hours a week if there's very little opportunity to organize cleaning days. But there will also be weeks where they might do 20 or 25 or something. So it kind of enables the, the budget to, to have that flex within it. So, yeah, I just wanted to flag annualized hours as a one of one. Thanks, Phil. Um, and just another one for Gleaning Cornwall is how many coordinators are there, which I think is five, is it, Holly? Well, we've got a couple of volunteers, well, three actual volunteer ones. Um, we lost a couple because it's so seasonal. So they went and got other proper jobs, you know? Um, and so that was a shame, but Jenny's sort of taken over a bit of their patch. Um, so currently we've got one, two, three, three main ones on the ground, and then three volunteer ones that occasionally get stuff that it's not their main thing. Um, and then I occasionally go and help out too when I'm allowed, <laughs> well, when it's local. But I'm generally stuck doing the funding, uh, which is terribly dull. But it all, what yeah. I found is getting people who know a bit about growing um, really helped and finding people who are just like really amazing, like Teresa and Jenny. You know, bloody hell, what Teresa does just makes you go, whoo, I'm not going to take up cleaning. But this is a massive county wide affair. You know, you don't have to um, people on the call go quite as gone uh, gone ho at it um, as we have down here. But, and we do grow a lot in, in Cornwall because we're mild. Um, so that's often the main issue is that you might just grow, you know, wheat um, for the majority of your county. And that just makes the whole thing not very feasible. Um, but then there's also the um, uh, uh, allotment folk to um, potentially get in contact for smaller little bits here and there. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Holly. Um, earlier on, there were a couple of questions. One of them was from Caroline, who was asking whether um, the farmer or the gleaner takes responsibility for offering facilities for the volunteers. Um, Do you want to answer that one, Jenny? I don't, I don't really understand. As in lose. Sorry. Toilets and snacks <laughs> or that sort of thing. Oh, I, well, I, I, I bring snacks. My flapjacks apparently are um, quite infamous now in Cornwall. Um, <laughs> and and sometimes we glean biscuits. So uh, we have some nice shortbread biscuits. But yeah, so um, I provide um, or we provide um, any kind of um, refreshments. And it's the far, it's up to the farmer whether or not there might be a toilet in the field. Um, sometimes people go without a drink if maybe there isn't a, a toilet in the field or behind a hedge. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I know Rosa was telling us earlier that they are um, a lovely farm to glean for because they do provide toilets and snacks and sometimes lunch. But that is no. not 
necessarily the case and shouldn't be expected of the farmer, I think is probably the main message. There was another um, question earlier on, which was about what is the most appropriate way to approach farmers? I could speak to that. Uh, Great. Thanks, Phil. I would say uh, in the first instance, a phone call is the mm -hmm. best way of trying to get a relationship formed. Uh, emails often go unanswered despite however well you I mean, I mean I think probably all of us struggle to keep up with our inboxes in modern life so if you're a busy farmer and someone's sending you quite a long inquiry by email you might not find time within your day or your week to respond so I, I think phone calls are the best first point and making it clear that you're not offering them a cleaning service because they always think that um, and then after you've got that relationship um yeah, ho hopefully there's an understanding after they've hosted you once or twice, and then you can text or WhatsApp or whatever works best for that particular, particular grower. But I would say at the first point, a phone call or even face to face, if you if you if they do markets or or there's a there's a chance to chat to some, a, a grower face to face, that's probably actually going to be even more effective than a phone call. But the dialogue is really helpful because it is quite a complicated proposition um, for a grower to get their heads around. So yeah, you need dialogue at the, in the first instance. That Phil, um, Tori, thanks for that, um, Phil. I, Tori, I can see that you've got your hand up. So go ahead. Yeah, actually, um, just to follow up, really, um, Phil, on on that, um, on your comments, they're really, really helpful. I'm just trying to think uh, through how. Um, if you're really early days in this process and not quite sure how to access and identify far farmers um, before you can even get to those contact details, it's are there particular organisations, growing organisations or associations that are a useful kind of wet route into actually finding out what's grown around you a lot of when you drive around the countryside, a lot of that's private land that you won't be able to access to actually see what's being grown. Um, and sometimes um, it can be a Google can be a bit too general to actually access the kind of information that might be out there, particularly if they're quite big commercial farms. Um, so, yeah, any any insight into how you can identify what's being grown and how you actually access those farming businesses, small and large. Um, I, if I jump in on that one, um, there is quite a lot you can do off the internet in that if you literally put in, um, you know, potato farmer, um, you, it's really good. It's amazing what you will come up with with potatoes. Um, it's not so easy with things like brassicas. In Cornwall, it's sort of fairly straightforward because we have these... Um, big producers that rent land off of huge amounts of farmers. So they're always the key ones that you've got to try and get on your side. They can be very difficult. Um, if you're really good, like Jenny, she's incredible at talking to farmers. Um, but yeah, you know, and also it, it's something, it's definitely something that's really difficult in the beginning. Um, I think word of mouth as well is what, you know, once you start talking to a couple of producers, um, um, you know, there's especially, I mean, I'm sure it's the same everywhere, but down here pretty much everyone knows everybody. <laughs> and and you're in a community, you know, you're, you're dipping your toe into the farming community. And if you ask, that's what I do. I ask, I say, do you know, do you know such and such? A, oh, such and such a, um, told me about this guy called John and apparently he grows turnips over there. And do you know, and nine out of 10 times, someone will give me John's phone number and I'll be able to ring John and he'll say, oh, I've heard of you guys. Yeah, why don't you come on down? So I think don't be afraid. Um, and don't, like I say, don't be put off by the, the kind of the not answering the phone and things. Be a, you have to be a little bit persistent um, and, and you know, you're, you're, you're doing something really, really good. And I think that nine times out of 10, people see that and they're really, really happy to work with you. So, yes, do troll the Internet, Facebook, um, all, all of the social media. It's really good. And everybody's so much more linked up now. So it's actually quite quite a lot easier now than it was a few years ago. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jenny and Teresa. That's really, really helpful. 
Um, there's a there's a question in the chat from Emma from Fairshare, which is sort of a question, but also a massive offer of help. So I'm flagging it up. Um, Emma's asking who is already collaborating with Fairshare in their region. And she's saying she's a manager at Fairshare and have managed to help other gleaning groups that already exist with volunteers, logistics and distribution. And that, that's quite a hot topic at Fairshare. I wonder, Emma, if you want to unmute and say a little bit more about that. We've got three minutes left, so it would have to be very brief. Yes, thank you, Natasha. Um, yeah, we had a meeting at, at Fairshare UK about gleaning before Christmas off the back of what we've been doing in Kent. So we're supporting two um, transition groups already um, who've been running in Kent for a few years. Um, they, What we've managed to do is because we already have a network of fans and logistics is augment what they do. Again, we're all on the same mission. Um, our biggest uh, supply at Fairshare now is produce uh, nationally, so fruit and vegetables. We've also got um, a push to do more locally in our regional centres, so to link up with local suppliers. We also have some farmer relationships already, which I think if we partner with you, possibly we could offer that too. So, uh, you know, we have groups coming to us offering volunteers hearing days um so i think there are times when we've got to a farm and um with a, a volunteer group in kent perhaps there's been six tons on one farm of pears which we can't take in one go but over a series of weeks because we're able to on top of their 20 charities distribute to uh, a wider network then between us we've been able to support the farmer uh, with taking all of that produce which otherwise we, without our support they may not have been able to access in the time before it would perhaps um, you know go to rot and not be usable um, I know there's several regional centres who on the chat before Christmas who are really interested in, in linking up with any local groups so if you if you're happy if anyone's happy for me to pass on details to some of our regional centres to to get some conversations going that that will be brilliant so uh, just to follow up on that, Emma, how is, is the best way for people to access their regional fair share coordinator to come to you first or is Yes. There... Yeah, if they come directly to me first, then I'll link up directly with the best contact in each centre. So will you just pop your email in the chat? <coughs> yep, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank well, you. I, I feel like that's a really positive note to end on. Um, we've just got a minute left, so I can just say a massive thank you to all the speakers for giving their time and also for what they do which is absolutely amazing and uh yeah just um the this recording will hopefully be edited but it will definitely be posted on the real farming trusts website uh by the end of march and just a big thank you to everyone who's been here and uh for your interactions and um have a really fantastic day thank you very much everyone <laughs>